Welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to present to you Erte, the father of Art Deco. Erte was a master of many traits, from graphic arts to costume couture to theater and set design. Erte is regarded as one of the most influential designers of the 20th century. His career spanned more than 80 years, and in that time he created thousands of pieces. Erte defined Art Deco as a fusion between the curvilinear designs of Art Nouveau and the geometric designs found in the cubist and constructivist works of modernism. His works were often unshaded and rendered in two dimensions, yet were still able to form depth and portray liveliness. This is due to his keen use of color, meticulous line work, and close attention to balance. Erte was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, on November 23, 1892, and given the name Roman Petrovich Tirtov, which became Romain de Tirtov in France. He came from a distinguished Russian family, who were loyal to the Tsar, and whose ancestry could be traced back to 1548. His father had served as an admiral in the Russian fleet, and his mother was a beautiful socialite. Throughout his career, Erte often said that his mother's dark hair and eyes against her lovely pale skin inspired his idea of feminine beauty. He said that the family's Persian miniatures also enthralled him, as well as the Greek artifacts that he would see when his mother took him out to the museums. Prior to the First World War, St. Petersburg was an extravagant place. It was home to many ballets, operas, and fashion boutiques. When Romain was young, his mother would take him out while his father was away on military assignments. This inspired him even more, and at the young age of five, he had helped the family dressmaker to design and construct a garment for his mother. His father had hoped that Romain would follow in his footsteps and join the military, but Romain had other plans. In February of 1912, at the age of 19, Romain went to live in Paris. When he first arrived, he worked as a draftsman in a fashion studio that surprisingly dismissed him for having no skill. Luckily, he was then hired on by Paul Poiret, who recognized his talent and gave him an 18-month contract. At this time, he began to be known as Erte, which is the sound made from his initials R and T, pronounced Er and T in French. It is said that he changed his name so as not to associate his family name with fashion, as his career path had greatly diverged from his father's wishes. Under Poiret, Erte was exposed to an innovative style that reinvented 20th century couture. Poiret revolutionized fashion by breaking away from the corset and returning to a more Hellenistic style of couture, created through a technique called draping. Poiret also was the first designer to market his own fragrance. His clothes reflected a fascination with Eastern art, as did the multitude of Arabian night-themed parties that he threw. This Eastern influence can be seen in this fashion sketch by Erte, especially in the headdress and embellishments on the pillow. One can also see the draping technique used in the design of the outfit. Many people said that Erte's art was reminiscent of Beardsley, and questioned whether or not Erte had modeled his work after him. Erte claimed, however, that he had not, and mentions in his memoir that he had not even heard of Beardsley until he had already been in Paris for over a year. Poiret's business was closed at the start of World War I, and Erte lived in Monte Carlo from 1914 to 1923, at which time his distant cousin, Prince Nicholas Orosov, came to live with him. Nicholas was his business manager, and connected Erte with Harper's Bazaar in New York. Erte began illustrating for Harper's Bazaar in January of 1915. Featured here is his first cover. Again one can see the Asian influence in the accessories of the figures, and the blue coloring of the one on the right. Also shown here are examples of modernism, in the boldness of the clothes, and in the composition itself. Another noteworthy element is the cage-like top to the woman's skirt, which we shall see later on becomes characteristic of Erte's costume design. This is another design of Erte's, done for the November 1920 issue of Harper's Bazaar. The lack of background pattern shows a strong modern influence. It is also lovely how Erte has balanced this composition radially by giving his dancer a spinning circular skirt. Though very two-dimensional and simplified, one can really feel the movement in this piece. 
Erte loved dance, and had at one time contemplating being a dancer, but realized that between art and dance, dance he could give up, but art he could not. Some of Erte's earliest costume designs were created in 1913 for Le Minieret, featuring one of the earliest belly dancers, the showgirl Matahari. Here is an example of one of Erte's costume designs. It is perfectly symmetrical and very symbolic, showing two men captured in the cage-like belt that extends off the figure's hips. This design was actually put into production in the Greenwich Village Follies, as shown in the photograph to the right. Erte not only designed costumes, but sets as well. He viewed the entire production as a complete project and would involve himself in every aspect guiding the seamstresses and set builders personally throughout their constructions. He had often expressed a desire to make all parts of the production come together perfectly in a unified and holistic way. Erte's designs were exhibited in Hollywood and on Broadway. In 1925, Louis B. Mayer brought him to Hollywood to design sets and costumes for the silent film Paris. He also designed for the films Ben-Hur, The Mystic, Time, The Comedian, and dance madness. On stage, he designed for productions in such venues as Radio City Music Hall, the Casino de Paris, and the Paris Opera, as well as for the Folies Bruges and George White's Scandals. Erte created original costumes and fashion designs for many of the era's most renowned screen actresses, including Joan Crawford, Lillian Gish, Marion Davis, Norma Shearer, and others. This cover from Harper's Bazaar is themed for the Paris theatrical openings of 1931. Notice how Bazaar is now spelled with two A's instead of one. This modification was made to the name of the magazine in 1929. The cover featured here is particularly beautiful and really shows a development into full swing art deco. The layout of the composition is filled with angular shapes including the diagonal divide that creates two perfect triangles suggested by the stage light. The details in the face, however, are very curvilinear, as shown in the delicate eyelash and the curl on the side of the forehead, which may have been created by Erte's method of using a single bristled paintbrush. This composition is asymmetrical yet balanced, as the macro-sized face on the left bears an equal visual weight to the micro-sized figures on the right. In 1933, Erte designed this cover that really reaches the epitome of Art Deco. It again combines the smooth, soft techniques of Art Nouveau, as seen in the woman, with the modern rigidness of the men behind her. She is really emphasized in this composition, wearing orange and yellow against the black and white of everything else. The men cascade proportionally backwards into the vanishing point, creating a perfect golden triangle. The shapes and colors of this piece are very reminiscent of constructivism. They could be compared to Malkovich's suprematist work or to Maholi Naji's 1923 Bauhaus poster. During his 20 plus years working with Harper's Bazaar, Erte created 2,500 gouache designs in the inner pages and 240 covers his work there lasted until December 1936, when William Randolph Hearst lost control of the magazine. It was at this time that the new publisher decided to go with photographs instead of fashion drawings, because photography had become more popular. Besides Harper's Bazaar, Erte also worked for Illustrated London News, Cosmopolitan, Ladies Home Journal, and Vogue. Erte's dazzling creations lost popularity through the World War II era, as things became more conservative in the style of the 40s and 50s. But he again became influential in the 60s with the Art Deco Renaissance. Now in his 70s, Erte began to recreate the remarkable designs of his earlier career in stereographs and bronze sculptures. A love for mythology plays into this piece, Wings of Victory, from 1975. This piece depicts the Greek goddess Nike in her beautiful draped garment. What is also interesting about this piece is the way that her headdress and the birds flying out of the background have an early 20th century aviator-like feel to them. This is Symphony in Black, 
one of Erte's best known later works. It depicts a thin black dog handled by a tall, slender woman draped in black. It has been reproduced over and over again, and a bronze rendering of it was owned by Elizabeth Taylor. Though not mentioned nearly as much as other designers of the 20th century, Erte has earned a unique place in the timeline of art history. He created thousands of works throughout his career and influenced many of the world's most famous fashion icons, such as Yves Saint Laurent, Oscar de la Renta, and Chanel. His original designs are held in the collections of prestigious museums throughout the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and London's Victoria and Albert Museum. Erte died in 1990 at the age of 97. Through his life, he graced this world with nearly 100 years of industrious elegance.